uh, yeah, let's get started on, on today's text. Uh, you know, it, it's, uh, um, you know this, this, this scripture really just kind of um, uh, relates to me a lot uh, when I, in, in terms of parenting kids and um, these young kids where our daughters are seven and five and, you know, our, our kids uh, uh, display like really on a daily basis. Uh, and if you, if you have kids, you would really understand this. But our kids display on a daily basis both their zeal for, for breaking free from our authority right? They, they want to be independent of us and live independently from us. But then uh, it also it always follows up with their eventual submission to the reality that they need us absolutely to live <laughs> and to stay alive for, for another day. And, um, and this tension, right? There's this tension. Uh, it's a daily mess. It's a daily mess of, of crying and arguing. It's a battle of wills. And it can get downright nasty sometimes, right? This, these wills that, and, and that they, they just can't win. Uh, they can't win. No matter how much the kids try, they need us. And they, they depend on us. And it, listen, it's good for them to depend on us. It's freeing to them to depend on us. When they don't depend on us, it really complicates things. And it's super oppressive in our house and in our family when they don't depend on us. And listen, as adults, this tension exists uh, as adults. It exists for all of us, this urgency that we feel, right, to depend and to pray uh, for our friends. We're, we're in a season right now for uh, Rachel and Jonathan, uh, our friends, who Rachel is in, in her, her life is on the line and she, uh, they're in dire need. And man, you guys really feel that right now, the urgency that we feel when, man, okay, things are really tough right now. Like, we need to lean in a little bit more and then really depend on God. That's a good thing. But it's difficult to live with such urgent dependence all the time, right? All the time. That's hard. Man, when you look at the past week, I look at myself and how, man, the adrenaline's been rushing for our friends who are in need, and their urgency is so strong and so deep, and there's sadness and there's crying and man you wish that we could be so urgent and dependent on God all the time but man, we, uh, it just doesn't work that way right we don't feel this sense of urgency all the time and unfortunately it requires pain and it requires suffering and it, it requires a hard road to to feel this urgency and, and to really zero in on God so we're, we're, we're resuming the, our study in the Gospel of Mark called Kingdom Come. And if you remember in Mark chapter 115, G Jesus says the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the, in the gospel. And, and in this gospel uh, that Mark is showing us, he's showing us what the kingdom of God is. And he's showing us what it means and how it is at hand. And, and how, what that means that it's here and now. Right? He's saying the kingdom of God is here and now. It's not just something you're waiting for when you die. No, the kingdom of God is here and now, and these matters are urgent. And he's saying now was the time for them to encounter it, and now is the time for us to encounter it. And so we're going to continue on in the Gospel of Mark, and we're in chapter 10, verses 13 to 16, and I'm calling this message uh, Kingdom Dependence kingdom dependence, and we're going to learn some things, okay? We're going to learn what is the kingdom of God exactly, okay? What's the kingdom of God? We're going to learn about the dirt road of dependence on God, the dirt road of dependence on God. We're going to learn the dead end of independence from God, the dead end of independence from God, and then we're going to learn depending on the dependence of another. I mean, that's going to make sense. You just bear with me. <laughs> Man, let's, let's pray real quick, and then we'll get into the text. Father, uh, thank you for this time, Lord. Uh, we lift up our church community to you. Uh, we thank you uh, just for all that you're doing, Lord, even, even in the midst of um, our pain and suffering and struggling and uh, trials and just obstacles and confusions. And um, man, you, you, don't, you don't promise us, Lord, um, a perfect life um, with, with no trouble, Lord, but you do promise us, Father, to those who love you and have believed in the gospel, uh, you promise us that you'll be with us in, in all of it, and you will walk with us through it to the end of it, Lord. 
And we thank you for that, God, and help us to depend on you a, a, a little bit more after today, Lord. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So uh, in, in Mark chapter 10, verses 13 to 16, it's going to be on the screen. Uh, the, the text says this. And they, and they were bringing children to him that, that he might touch them. And the disciples rebuked them. But when Jesus saw it, he was indignant. And he said to them, let the children come to me. Do not hinder them. For to such belongs the kingdom of God. Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. And he took them in his arms and blessed them and laying his hands on them. Man, so Jesus, he, he, we've been learning in the Gospel of Mark up to this point. He's doing his thing. He's teaching. He's doing miracles. He's drawing crowds to himself. And these crowds, they start, they start to bring their kids to Jesus, their children. And what they really wanted was they wanted Jesus to bless them. They wanted Jesus to sort of like dedicate them and to, and to bless them. You know, they, they're, they're learning about who Jesus is, right? And you, you, you just want to be near him. Like Jesus is remarkable, and they just want to be near him. They're like, man, I want my kid to be near this guy. Like, I just want them to have something that Jesus has. So they're just bringing children to Jesus. And Jesus and the disciples, you know, they're, they're just like, whoa, 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 whoa. No, 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 no. So they, they kind of back the children off. And, you know, back then in that time, children were, they were sort of marginalized. They were really more seen as property. And people didn't, like, really kind of see their value. So, man, and, 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 and them thinking that this is the Messiah right here, they're like, whoa, whoa, no, G children, they're, this isn't their business. Jesus isn't their business. And now Jesus is like, no, this is my business. <laughs> no, children are my business. Children are a part of this, too. Right? They're a part of this too. Bring them to me. And Jesus is like, seriously? Let them come to me. Let them come to me. Do not hinder them. And then he says this powerful statement. He says, for to such belongs the kingdom of God. Whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child, like a child shall not enter it. Shall not enter it. And so what does Jesus mean by that? What is going on here? What does he mean by this? First, we have to understand what exactly the kingdom of God is before we can answer that question, what Jesus is talking about here. And that's our first point. What is the kingdom of God? To begin with, it's critical to understand that the kingdom of God is not exclusively eternal life, right? It's not exclusively heaven. That's not really what Jesus is talking about here. In the Gospels, the phrase, the kingdom of God, it refers to the rule and reign of God in our lives on earth. Now. Right now. Right? It's about God's will being done on earth as it's done in heaven. It's not about leaving earth and going to heaven when we die. It's not exclusively that. Rather, it's about heaven coming down to earth while we live. Right? Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Y'all know that, right? You know that prayer. Right? If you remember, it's, so it's a lived experience and, and being a part of that. And if you remember, in chapter 1, verse 15, Jesus said, right? What's, remember, the kingdom of God is at hand. Right? It's at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. He's saying it's here. It's now. It's here. It's now. It's not just later. It is later in full, but it's also now. The kingdom of God is here now. It has yet to come in full, but it's here now. We can live and experience it in this life here right now. And when Jesus says, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. They shall not enter it. He's not saying we, we must become a child to have eternal life. That's not what he's saying. Eternal life is received by faith alone and Christ alone and what he has done on the cross for the forgiveness of our sins, right? What he's saying is experiencing the kingdom of God in this life and entering it requires becoming like a child, Okay, so when we enter into a relationship with Jesus by faith, man, the Holy Spirit gives us a new heart, new eyes to see the world differently and to experience God. And, and he teaches us to see and experience and live in the kingdom of God right now, right now. So what is it about a child 
that he's talking about that enables us to receive the kingdom of God and to enter into the kingdom of God. What Jesus is talking about is what every child who has ever lived has experienced. Helpless dependence. Helpless dependence. Guys, I, I want to explain a major theme throughout the Bible. When you read the scriptures, when you go through the Bible, a major theme on every page throughout the Bible is this tension that I was talking about earlier, right? This tension between man's independence from God and his people's dependence on him. And, and, and it's this tension. Man, they fail a lot. Man, they succeed. Man, they fail. They mess up. Right? There's that tension you see on every page. So I want to talk about this, this second point, the dirt road of dependence on God. This theme of dependence on God can perhaps be most clearly seen in, when you read the book of Exodus in, in chapter 13. Listen, God, he promised his people Israel to take them to a land of their own, right? The promised land called the land of Canaan. Man, he promised his people to take them there. And in Exodus, when God delivers Israel from Egypt, they reach a crossroads. They reach this crossroads. God can take them one of two paths. You remember this story? He can take them one of two paths to Canaan. There was the way of the sea, right? The way of the Mediterranean Sea. And there was the way of the wilderness. There was the way of the wilderness. Now, the way of the sea, the way of the sea was, it was the good roads. It was the nearest route, right? It was the shortest route to Canaan. It was the convenient route. It was the predictable route to Canaan. It was the route that everybody took to get to the land of Canaan. Right? It was the straightest route. It was the most traveled route to Canaan. And then there was the way of the wilderness. Nobody ever took that route. Nobody ever took the way of the wilderness. It was unpredictable. It was the least direct. It was the longest route. <laughs> right? It was the longest route to the promised land. It was the road less traveled. It was dangerous. It was mountainous terrain. And you all know what God does. He takes them the way of the wilderness. He takes them the way of the wilderness, the long route. And the reason for this route, the reason he does it, is to continuously test Israel's faith and to teach them lessons of dependence on him. Lessons of dependence on him. This, this turn to go down this road sets the stage for the next 40 years as you read Exodus and, and Numbers all these stories, the next 40 years or more in their history, starts with this crossroads. All of those stories, their challenges, their trials, their, their suffering, thrills of victory and obedience, agony of defeat and, and disobedience and, and their failure, and, and this tension, you, there's this tension that's palpable in the scriptures between the moments of breaking free from, independence, from their dependence on God to, to their submission to their desperate need for him. Man, guys, listen, I don't know about you. It is for me, because when, when I prepare a sermon, I think about what, how, do, how do I apply to this. I don't know about you, but my instinct, and maybe it's your instinct too, is we want to pursue comfort. Man, we want to pursue comfort. We're risk-averse. Man, we don't want to take risks, right? We're risk-averse. We resist discomfort. We resist inconvenience. We want the short route. We want the straight route. Right? We want the clean, the easy route. Right? We, that's what we want. We choose the path that we feel like we can have control over. Okay, no, I'll, I'll take this route because I can kind of control things. I can't take that route because I'm going to feel like I don't got any control. Right? It's the path that keeps us confident in ourselves. Right? Man, we would have been like, if we were back then when God took them to that crossroads, we would have been like, why can't we just take the coastal route? It takes us to the same place, right? That's really what it's all about. It's where we're going. It's not how we're getting there. It doesn't matter how we get there. It takes us to the same place. And God says the path is just as important as the destination. Mediterranean beaches won't teach you to depend on me. They won't. They won't teach you to depend on me. And God's like, I don't want you to be confident in yourself. I want you to be confident in me. That's what God says. I want you to be confident in me. I don't want you to be confident in yourself. And they wouldn't have depended on him. 
They wouldn't have depended on him on the easy road. Rather, it only happens on the hard path. And listen, the Bible, the whole Bible, when you read through the pages, is marked with true story after true story of God training his people to depend on him like children. Like children. When Jesus and the disciples, right, they have 5,000 hangry people in front of them, right? 5,000 people are mad and they're hungry, and he asks them, well, guys, what should we do? He's testing them. The scripture says he's testing them, right? Was their first instinct to depend on Jesus? Or was their first instinct to depend on themselves and their ingenuity and, and their strategy, right? And if you remember that story, what do they do? Their first instinct is to look at their money and to look, you know, how many they have. And they're relying on their ingenuity, right? And their strategy, that was their first instinct. Their first instinct wasn't to depend on Jesus. Guys, it's not because of a child's innocence or their gentleness, <laughs> their simplicity or their purity that Jesus uses that children as an example to make this point. Guys, it is nothing but their helplessness. It, it is their helplessness. It's not about what they bring to the table. It's about what they lack. It's about what they lack. And it, for us, it's not about what we bring to the table. It's about what we lack. It's about what we lack. It's okay to lack. It's okay to lack. Children are, are small. Children are powerless. They're, they're needy. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> they are so needy. Children are, are completely hopeless without, without parents or, or some kind of adult intervention. They are completely hopeless without hope, without their parents or some adult intervention. It, 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 it's simple. It's, it's, it's humble, helpless dependence on God that ushers the kingdom of God into our lives. That's it. Helplessness. Lack. At the throne of God, guys, we lack everything at the throne of God. Don't compare yourself to others, other people. Guys, you look at you yourself and your relationship with God, and, and what do you really see, man? When you look in the scriptures, guys, we bring nothing to the table. We bring nothing to the table when it comes to God. We have no control of our lives. Think about it. Do we really have control of our lives when we look at our friends, Rachel and Jonathan? We have no control over our lives. It is an illusion to believe that we have control over our lives. Things just happen. Y'all know? Things just happen. And we have no control over it. Without God, we have no hope. And this childlike dependence on God is lost on us without God's intervention. We don't depend on God like we should. Why? Well, that's our next point here, the dead end of independence from God. Guys, because of sin, it's because of sin. We're, we're all born with this operating system, this operating system that is independent of, of God, but nobody lives independently of anything, okay? Listen, nobody lives independently of anything. We're all dependent on something or somebody. God has built our hearts for dependence on him, but because of sin, we de our dependence goes elsewhere. Why does this happen? Guys, when we look in the scriptures, we look time and time again, it's because of idolatry. It's because of idolatry. When we love and depend on something and somebody more than God himself, more than God himself, when we, when, we, when we trust and place all of our hopes and our dreams and expectations on them, on our idols, to satisfy us and to fulfill us, right? And listen, we have deep idols, these deep emotional idols like security and comfort and success and significance, and self-worth, and we feed them with these surface-level idols, right? Like, and it's even often good things. 
It's actually good things more often than it is bad things. These good things become our surface level idols like money, like a job, like a career, success. It could be a person. It could be a relationship with somebody. It could be a hobby. It could be a hobby. It could be a vision or an ideal of the way you want something to be in your life. But nothing or nobody can live up to those expectations. No, nothing or nobody can live up to that. And when they inevitably don't, it crushes us. And it scars us and it jades us. As our idols are threatened and lost, we become bitter. We become resentful. We become unforgiving. We hold grudges. We hold grudges. We harbor fear. And, and over time, we lose hope. We lose hope because our hopes have been dashed so many times by our idols. We don't know where else to go. So what we end up doing, I've been there before, so, so we just keep doing it because it's, it's, we've always done it that way. We don't know any other way. We don't know any other way. We can't imagine doing it any, any differently. So we jump from idol to idol, and we don't even realize it. We don't know it. And ultimately, we just feel like the only person that we can depend on is who? Ourselves. Ourselves. Revealing our truest and deepest idol, which is the self. Guys, instead of depending on God, we live as if everything depends on us. And that is no way to live. That's no way to live. So, so what's the solution? What's the solution? Well, our, our, our final point, depending on the dependence of another. Guys, remember what I said, the heart is never independent of anything. No, something is always going to fill our heart. That's just the way God designed our hearts, something, right? It's never independent of anything. It's always dependent on somebody or something. The heart, it needs a deeper, more powerful place to rest its hope. And it's not our own dependence on God. Right? It's not merely enough to, to depend on our dependence on God. And many people are doing that. Many Christians are doing that, right? They're thinking to myself, man, I need to depend on my own dependence on God so, so God can commit himself to me, right? God will only commit, my, commit himself to me if, if I commit myself to him. So I'm going to depend on my dependence. No, you're not depending on your dependence on God. That's not enough. Our dependence will always fluctuate. Just like, you, just like you see in the scriptures, our dependence is going to fail. It's going to fail. We'll have successes, but we're also, there's going to be that tension. We're going to fail sometimes. We're going to fail a lot, actually. We're going to fail a lot. We need to depend on the dependence of another, and that's Jesus. That's Jesus. In the Gospel of John, chapter 5, he says this, the son can do nothing by himself. He's talking about himself. Jesus is saying, I can do nothing without the father. Jesus is completely and entirely 100% dependent on the father. And this is Jesus. This is the Messiah. This is the son of God. And he is completely dependent on the father. In, in Christ, God took on the indignity of dependence. Being born a baby, he was born a child, totally dependent on the care of his earthly parents and his heavenly father. And though Jesus was God, as a human, he was completely and perfectly dependent on the father to do his will at all times. He depended on the father for everything, especially the strength to go to the cross, to go to the cross, to die for our sins and saving us. In the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus painfully knew the separation from his Father that was coming on the cross. And he knew the excruciating anguish that awaited him the next day on the cross, and yet he never lost his dependence on the Father. He needed it. We must not depend on our dependence on God. Guys, we're going to fail. It's going to fluctuate. We're going to have seasons, man... 
This, this past week has shown me how independent of God I've been living. Right? When something happens and all that urgency comes and it's like, holy moly, have I been independent of God? I have not been relying on him when stuff like this happens. And it's like, man, God, I, I want this all the time. But unfortunately, it doesn't work that way. Guys, at some point, it's going to happen. You know, God willing, Rachel is going to come out of this. She's going to heal and, you know, and then, and then we're going to get comfortable again. And we're going to depend less on God. We'll pray less, right? Isn't that what happens when the going gets tough? You pray more, right? You pray more. You lean in on God. It's going to happen. Because that's the sinful flesh having its way and, and working in our lives. We must not depend on our dependence on God. We must depend on Jesus' dependence on the Father. He is our only hope. He is our only hope. And the more you understand the depth of your brokenness and your helplessness, your childlikeness, and the more you understand the depth of Christ's dependence on the Father for you and, and his love for you, despite your brokenness, despite your brokenness, the less pleasing idols will become and the more compelling that you will be to depend on him. Like how it only complicates our kids' lives when they try to operate independently of us. Like that, trying to live independently from God, it'll only hurt us. It'll complicate things. It'll complicate things. Dependence on God frees us. It frees us. And when we place our love and our hopes and dreams in Jesus, we'll, we'll, we'll be to become like children again in our dependence. The tension between our independence from God and our, our dependence on him, it won't completely go away. It won't completely go away in this life. But our trajectory, our trajectory of dependence will grow over time. Man, th that line's going to go down sometimes, but then psh, it's going to go back up. Right? And then we're going to get comfortable. And then, but that trajectory will grow over time. We'll depend on God through prayer, through prayer, through, through community, right? Church community, gathering Sunday mornings and Monday through Saturday, through the crying out, through the transparency with God, through being honest with God, and, and through the wrestling. And that's that's where that's how it's gonna happen.